Hello, church, and greetings to our new friends. My name's Andrew, and I'm one of the ministers at Livingston. I'm glad you're devoting time to sing and pray to the true God who lives and reigns forever, and I hope you have a Bible. I hope you're ready to get into God's Word. Livingston's a great spiritual family. I hope you'll come out and worship with us soon. We're easing back into regular worship assemblies, so we're meeting Sundays at 9 a.m. for a mask-required service or 11 a.m. for a mask-optional service. You can learn more or contact us at our website, christiansmeethere.org. That's christiansmeethere.org. And please subscribe to our daily podcast, Text Talk. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. So until we can meet, or until we can meet again, please know that we love you and we're praying for you. Now, let's give God our best. Well, I'll ask you to bow your heads with me as we pray to the great God of heaven. Our Heavenly Father, you who are Lord of Lords and King of Kings, you who have created this earth and all that is in it, when we consider the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? But you've made him but a little lower than the angels, crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your fingers and put all of these things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and all that passes through the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We humble ourselves in your presence, O oh God, and we cannot even conceive the depth of the riches of the majesty of your power and of your knowledge and wisdom. How unsearchable are your judgments and your ways past finding out. And so this day, as we look about us and we think of you as our King of Kings, we're thinking of all the things going on in our own country today, things that do not bring glory to you. Our nation has uh, committed things that are sinful in your sight. We have not protected the unborn child. We have declared things righteous in marriage that, are, that you call an abomination. We have done things, O oh God, that have brought reproach upon your holy name. And we confess our sins before you today. And we call upon you to look upon us with mercy and grace and to forgive. And we pray that those of us who are deeply concerned about your ways will have sufficient salt and light power in this world, and especially in our country, to preserve it for another generation. And we pray you will bless us to be lifting up your name and to promote it in this country and around the world. And we pray for our rulers that they may turn their attention more to the principles that you have laid down and that they may develop principles and rules and regulations and even the enforcement thereof in such a way that our country may have peace and that we may be able to proclaim the gospel clearly and truly and without interference. And we thank you for the freedoms we've experienced here for so long. And so we're praying this day, O oh God, that you bless us with the courage and the strength to stand up, to be counted for you, to be faithful to your principles. And we thank you for the brotherhood that surrounds us. We thank you for our group at Livingston that does our best to try together to serve you in unity and harmony and to praise your holy name. And we ask you to bless our worship even this day. In Jesus' holy name. And amen.
Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise your holy name. Father, we praise you as our creator and the one who sustains this world and who provides for all of our needs. And Father, in a world of turmoil, you and Jesus are a God and Prince of peace. And we just ask that you would overshadow us with your peace and that you would overshadow the world with your peace. Father, we know that so many people right now have been suffering due to uh, the coronavirus and many people are anxious about it or anxious about family members or friends who are sick at this time. And we just ask that you would give your peace and comfort to them and that if it be your will that you would help this disease to go away um, so that people can return to somewhat normal lives. Um, and we ask that you would be with all those of all sorts of, who are suffering with all sorts of different illnesses and diseases and sicknesses. And we know that this life is fleeting and that um, not everyone will be healed from their physical affliction, but we know that you can give physical healing. And so we still pray to you um, for that, for people. But help um, everyone in the world to turn to you even more than their physical healing, to turn to you for their spiritual healing, because we know that you are the only one who can heal our sin, who can heal our spiritual diseases. And so we just ask that you would work in our hearts and that you would teach us from your word, help us to have a spirit like Jesus and to live and walk in his footsteps as we go through our lives and help us to uh, just live in your word and uh, look to it for our food. And Father, we also ask for peace um, with all of the um, protests here recently. We just, we know that you are a God who loves justice, and we ask that justice would be um, carried out, and that there would also be spirits of compassion, uh, that there would be a spirit of respect, and just that you would be um, honored as our ultimate authority, and that both your sense of justice would be carried out by our government, and also that our government would be respected when it is due respect, and also just that uh, peace in general would prevail because we know that uh, you are a God who loves peace and uh, that serving you is not a matter of disorder, but that when you come into our lives and when your influence and the gospel's influence comes into the world, that it brings about peace and um, ordered lives. So we just beg that you would be with all of those um, who are hurting for a variety of reasons at this time, and we ask that um, you would be glorified through all of these things, and we know that you are in control and that you can use all of these events that are going on in the world right now to um, work to your glory and to turn men's hearts to you. And we ask also that you would be with the church and strengthen us all as um, this has been an unusual time here recently with not meeting together as regularly as or in the same way that we normally do. And we thank you so much that we can meet together um, for at least one service on Sunday. And we thank you for um, the efforts of all those who have continued to um, give us messages from your word online, and we just ask that you've been glorified through this, and that the church has actually grown stronger in faith through this, because we know that um, your spirit working in our lives can transcend any sort of uh, situation we have to deal with, and we just ask that you would strengthen our faiths and help us to continually draw closer to you. Father, help us to worship you each day of our lives, and please uh, open our hearts today, particularly as we remember Jesus 
and as we uh, study your word and worship you through song. We praise you, Father, and we look to you for our peace. It's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. 
There's a lot of irony in this first sentence of Paul's last letter. As we read this, we are actually getting to eavesdrop on what, for all intents and purposes, is one of the most personal letters, a personal correspondence, personal conversations that Paul had in his entire life. We're essentially getting to listen in on the words of a dying father as he speaks to his firstborn child and passes on to him the generational legacy, calling him to to take on his mantle and his mission and his life's work. But the irony, Paul had no children. He is a childless father. Even more, he is writing to a fatherless child. Of course, those who have studied their Bibles for some time are aware that I don't mean that in a literal sense. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 1, we learn that Timothy had a Jewish mother and a Greek father. But on a spiritual basis, Timothy's father was an absentee father. Here in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul talks about the generational legacy that Timothy had, but the father's not included. I am reminded of your sincere faith, Paul says to Timothy, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. The father wasn't in the picture. And yet what we find is this childless father takes the fatherless child under his wing, teaches him, trains him, sets him up for work, and sets him loose on a commission to to go forth and do the work of God. And yet, he's dying. And he has no child of his own, no biological child to to pass his inheritance along to, to, to give the mantle to, to lift up in the family generational occupation. And so he reaches out to this fatherless child. Timothy, whose father apparently had no spiritual wisdom to pass along to him, who, who left him with no mission, left him with no commission, no words of wisdom, as he parted, but he found a father figure in Paul. But now that father figure is dying, is leaving him. And what's Timothy to do? How is he to be able to walk in the footsteps, to to put on the shoes, to carry the mantle of this father figure, Paul? And why would Paul even want Timothy to be the one to do that? As we read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, we are walking on sacred ground. Certainly it's sacred because it's scripture. But not only that, it's sacred because God has allowed us a glimpse into this most private and intimate of moments of a father talking to his child. This most personal conversation. And we get a glimpse of it. And as we do, we see the advice of a childless father to a fatherless child. And within it, we actually find the advice that every father needs to pass on to his sons and daughters. And we learn the two ingredients of courage and victory for Christians like us. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your mother Lois, excuse me, your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, 
and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. We've got two questions that I think we need to ask about this text. And as we answer them, we'll discover not only the advice that every father, every parent should pass on to their children, the, the, the advice that, that every child, son or daughter needs to hear, but we'll learn the two ingredients of courage and victory. The first question, why did Paul need to write this to Timothy? Why did Paul need to say this to Timothy? Apparently, Paul has, for the second time, been arrested and imprisoned in Rome. He's been through that before, and he has been delivered, and yet this time he is certain that he is not going to escape. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Put yourself in Paul's shoes. What do you need right now? What do you most need right now? You, you've worked hard. You've kept the faith. You've fought the good fight. And now your time is done. But there's more work to do. There, there are Christians who need to be strengthened. There are congregations that need to be encouraged. There are false teachers that need to be confronted. And you know that, that the dark days are coming, not merely because there's a persecution going on even right now that's caused you to be put in jail, but because you know that, that there's going to be a great apostasy, that Christians themselves, churches themselves are going to be turning away from the Lord. Here's, here's what Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. But understand this, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1. Understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. And then later in chapter 4, in verse 3, he writes, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. You've worked hard, but there's work left to do. And you're Paul, and you know that your end is coming. What do you most want right now? What do you most need? You need a successor. You need a Joshua, an Elisha, a David. You need someone to follow up and continue on with your work. But Paul has no biological child. He has no son that he can pass on this family mission to. He's going to search for one. And who does he choose? He chooses Timothy. And so he writes this letter to Timothy, but why? Why Timothy? Why does Timothy need to hear this right now? Surely there were dozens of other people that Paul could have chosen, that he could have written to. Surely, surely there were dozens of churches that he needed to spend these last days writing to and shoring them up. Surely there were other encouragements and instructions and corrections that he needed to give. But he takes this last opportunity to write, and he writes to Timothy. Why? Why is Timothy the one? And why did God think that it needed to be preserved so that you and I could read it today? Why did Paul need to write this to Timothy? Before we answer the question why Paul chose Timothy, I want to back up a little bit. I want us to remember why Jesus chose Paul. Back in 1 Timothy chapter 1, as Paul wrote his first letter to his protege, he explains Jesus' choice of himself, Paul. 
And in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, he says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Certainly when Paul was appointed, he was not a believer. When Jesus decided, Paul's the man to be my ambassador, he was not a believer. But Jesus saw something in Paul. He saw a faithfulness, a loyalty, a faith that when corrected by truth would make Paul an amazing ambassador for the kingdom of Christ. What did Jesus see in Paul? Faithfulness. Faith. Now, before we jump to why Paul chose Timothy, I actually want to skip Timothy, and I want to look at what it is that Paul commissions Timothy to do. He summarizes it in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. He's going to get into a lot of different details of the commission throughout the rest of the letter, but listen to this summary in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Are you seeing what's happening here? Jesus chose Paul because he saw that faith in him, and he saw the faithfulness And now Paul is choosing Timothy. And what's Timothy supposed to go searching for? He's supposed to go searching for men who have that exact same quality that Paul had. The faith. The faithfulness. So that they will teach others. Smack in the middle of that, there's Paul choosing Timothy. Are you you already starting to guess what the quality was? What the key was? Why Paul chose Timothy? Well, let's look at that hinge between Paul and and these men Timothy's supposed to find. Paul actually states his reason for choosing Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. I thank God, whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, as I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. For this reason, Paul says, I'm reminding you to step up to the plate. For what reason? What Paul says is, Timothy, every day I pray for you, and when I remember you in my prayers, I remember the sorrow that you had when we parted ways last. And I am reminded during those prayers of your faith, of your sincere faith, of your generational legacy of faith, of where it came from, how it was passed from your grandmother to your mother to you, and I am convinced it's in you as well for this reason. I'm choosing you. For what reason? Because Paul saw in Timothy exactly what Jesus saw in Paul. Because Paul saw in Timothy exactly what he wanted Timothy to look for in others. Faith. I think it's regrettable that most of the commentators today Focus on some of the potential definitions for some of the words in these first paragraphs and create a picture in their mind of Timothy that I simply believe cannot be the case. You can read the commentaries yourself. Most of them will say things like, well, look, Paul says that he has to remind Timothy. Clearly, Timothy must not have been all that disciplined and he needed a constant prodding and reminding to go do the work. Not only that, but this phrase that the English Standard Version translates fan into flame could also be translated to rekindle or reignite. And so, obviously, Timothy must be a person whose service and devotion has flagged. He's he's started to slip. He says in verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of 
fear. And so it must be that Timothy was a timid and shy and, and even cowardly person. And then in verse 8, he's going to go on to say, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. And so Timothy must have been given to bouts of shame and not always standing firm and convicted. And they almost present this picture of this weak, wishy-washy, flaky, undisciplined, all but untrustworthy worker. I just don't think that that's the case for Timothy. Think about this. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, and multiple times, when Moses was commissioning Joshua, he told him over and over again, be strong and courageous. Don't fear and be dismayed. Was that because Joshua was a coward? Well, of course not. It's because Joshua was about to embark on a fearful mission. And even the brave, when they're embarking on a fearful mission, need to be reminded, be strong, be courageous. You don't need to be afraid. Or think about Peter's own swan song, the last letter that he wrote. He wrote one that was not to an individual, but to a general group. And in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, listen to what he says. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Peter says they knew these things and they were established in them, and yet what was he going to do? He was going to remind them. Why? Because even the faithful need to be reminded. We're dealing with such important things that even those who are established in them need to be reminded. I think it's a mistake to look at all of these words and assume this very negative picture of Timothy. And I think this negative picture, focusing on these word definitions, fails to take into account the situational context of Paul, who had been chosen by Jesus because of faith and faithfulness, and the commission that he's going to give to Timothy to find other men who are filled with faith, filled with faithfulness, and seeing Timothy is right there standing in the gap between them. Why? Because he has that key, faith. Now, it could be that I'm wrong. Maybe the commentators are right. Maybe, maybe Timothy was a coward. Maybe Timothy was undisciplined. Maybe he was afraid. Maybe he was flaky and wishy-washy and often ashamed. If I'm wrong about this, though, that just highlights this key all the more. It brings it into stark contrast because what it points out is that Paul saw in Timothy, even if he saw all of these other weaknesses, he saw in Timothy the one strength that trumped them all. He saw the one strength that he knew Timothy has this, and for everything else that's going against him, this one thing will make it okay, will help him overcome. And what was that one thing? Faith. Faithfulness. And do you see the way Paul frames this? He says in verse 3, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience. He presents his service to the Lord as this generational, excuse me, generational legacy that's been passed down from father to son to grandson and on and on and on. But now he has no child to pass it along to. But there's Timothy, who has no father to pass along this legacy to him. Yet, he did have a generational legacy. It passed from grandmother to mother to Timothy. By the way, this demonstrates that what we're talking about here is not just a legacy to pass from father to sons and daughters, but from mother to children as well. And so what Paul says is, I have this generational legacy of faithful, sincere service, and I look at you, Timothy, and I see your sincere faith, and I am passing along to you. You will be my successor. You will take up that mantle. Why? Because I see in you the very thing Jesus saw in me, faith. And because you have faith, you will have victory. Sons and daughters, I don't know what advice your fathers have been giving you. And fathers, I don't know what what advice you've been giving your sons and daughters, what message you've been passing along to them. Timothy was being commissioned for one of the toughest missions ever, a fearful mission. 
And Paul, the childless father, speaks to Timothy, the fatherless child. And he passes on this advice, the advice that, that every father should pass on to their children, that every child should hear from his or her father or mother. Or maybe you're like Timothy and you're a fatherless child. Paul wasn't Timothy's father, but he passed this message on to him as every father should, and he's passing this message on to you. Faith is the victory. Your faith is the first ingredient of courage. Your faith is the first ingredient of victory. Not faith in yourself, faith in God. Which actually leads us to our second question. We've asked from this text, why did Paul need to say this to Timothy? Let's ask this question now. Why did Timothy need to hear this from Paul? Why did Timothy need to hear this from Paul? Why did he need to hear it right now? We've put ourselves in Paul's shoes. Let's, let's put ourselves in Timothy's shoes right now. I mean, I've been trained up in faith. I learned faith from my mother and my grandmother. I actually got to start to be trained by the greatest teacher in Christ's kingdom. I, I followed him around. I learned all that he had to teach. He's, he's already sent me off on missions. I've worked with the church in Ephesus. I've done so much. I've been trained. I've been prepared. I've got a sincere faith. Honestly, most of what he tells me in the second letter, he told me in the first letter. So why do I need to hear this? And why do I need to hear it? right now. Let's think about where Timothy is. He's the fatherless child. The absentee father who, who though he was present, seems in a material and physical sense, was not present in a spiritual sense. He had no words of wisdom to part with. He left him no mission, no legacy, no commission. And yet, he found this father figure in Paul. But now Paul's dying. And what do I most need in this moment when my father figure is passing on? Before we answer that question, let's back up again. I want to share with you a history of succession stories a history of successors that actually provide the background for what's going on in this passage. I want you to think about Joshua. You remember Joshua, the successor to Moses? I've got a couple of lengthy passages here, but it's important to read them in Numbers chapter 27, beginning at verse 12. In Numbers chapter 27 and verse 12, the Lord said to Moses, go up into this mountain of Abiram and see the land that I have given to the people of Israel. When you have seen it, you also shall be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron was. Because you rebelled against my word in the wilderness of Zen when the congregation quarreled, failing to uphold me as holy at the waters before their eyes. These are the waters of Meribah of Kadesh in the wilderness of Zen. Moses spoke to the Lord saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be a sheep that have no shepherd. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand on him. Make him stand before Eleazar, the priest, and all the congregation, and you shall commission him in their sight." You shall invest him with some of your authority that all the congregation of the people of Israel may obey. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest who shall inquire for him by the judgment of the Urim before the Lord. At his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the people of Israel with him, the whole congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua, made him stand before Eleazar the priest and the whole congregation, and he laid his hands on him and commissioned him as the Lord directed through Moses. And then we get to the end of Deuteronomy. And we see this account 
expressed again, this time in Deuteronomy chapter 31. We'll begin in verse 1. In Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 1. So Moses continued to speak these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I'm 120 years old today. I'm no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you will dispossess them. And Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, into their land when he destroyed them. And the Lord will give them over to you, and you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. And then in verse 14 of Deuteronomy 31, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tent of meeting that I may commission him. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tent of meeting. And the Lord appeared in the tent in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood over the entrance of the tent. And then we move to the very last paragraph of the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 9, Deuteronomy 34 and verse 9, And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. What was the point for Joshua? What was it that Moses was conveying to Joshua? He was saying to Joshua, Joshua, it's not been about me, and it's not going to be about you. It's about God who is with you. It's about our God. And when God is with you, you have everything you need to accomplish this mission. What about Elisha? Elisha, the successor to Elijah. We read about him in 2 Kings chapter 2. Now, Elisha was a little bit more eager than many of the other successors to take up the mantle, but even Elisha was aware of what he needed if he was going to follow in the footsteps of Elijah after Elijah died. In 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning at verse 6, Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, that is, Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water. And the water was parted to the one side and to the other till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, 2 Kings 2.9, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you've asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I'm being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by the whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes, and he tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, the water parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. What was the message for Elisha? It's not about Elijah. It's not about Elisha. It's about God who was with them. 
And Elisha knew what he needed. He needed the God who was with Elijah. And the lesson for Elisha was simply this. With God, you have all you need. With God, you are prepared for this mission. What about David? Now, this is a different succession story because King Saul had actually chosen a different successor. Saul did want his biological son to be the next king, but God had chosen the successor, and God's choice was David. And in 1 Samuel chapter 16, we see when God chose David and had David anointed. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 16, about halfway through verse 11. Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him. Go get David, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in, that is David. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But now listen to the next verse about Saul. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And we hear the story about that harmful spirit and how David could play music for him and calm that spirit. But what's the message? What's the message for David? The message is very simply, it wasn't about Saul. It's not about David. It's about God and his presence. It's about the spirit of the Lord being with them. And when the spirit of the Lord left Saul, what happened next? His behavior becomes erratic. He descends essentially into a kind of madness. And he doesn't have what he needs to accomplish the mission to be king. But what happens next for David? Have you ever noticed this? The spirit rushes upon him in chapter 16. What happens in chapter 17? Goliath. Saul, hiding with fear in his tent, unable to go out and fight Goliath, but David, with the spirit of the Lord, steps up and says, I'll do it. What's the message? It's not about Saul. It's not about you, David. It's about God. It's about God who is with you. And when God is with you, you have everything you need to accomplish this mission. Let's go back to Timothy. Why did Timothy need to hear what Paul had to say? And why did he need to hear it right now? Because Paul was commissioning Timothy to be his successor. Paul was commissioning him not to be an apostle. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 8 points out that Paul was the last of those. He says, as one untimely born. But he was commissioning Timothy to take up the work. Put yourself in Timothy's shoes. Put yourself in Timothy's shoes. Paul is commissioning you. He's calling on you. He says, that work that I was doing, it's time for you to step up. It's time for you to do it. What's your response to that? Is it, yes, finally, I knew it should be me. I knew I should be the one that follows in the footsteps of Paul and takes on his job. I have been waiting for this opportunity. I can't wait to get back to traveling all over Europe and Asia. I gotta tell you, I sure hope I face some hardship and toil. Man, I hope I get to look forward to some imprisonments and some beatings and some stonings. I have just been waiting to experience dangers at sea and in the city and in the wilderness. I've been waiting to experience danger from the Jews and danger from the Gentiles and dangers even from false brethren. And man, I tell you what, I just, I, I, I've i almost been unable to wait for the opportunity to bear the burden of the anxiety and concern daily for all the churches. Yes! Is that what you're thinking? Or is it something a little bit more like this? W wait, wait, what are you saying? 
you, you, want, you want me to do this job? I'm not ready for this job. I'm not qualified for this job. I'm not smart enough for this job. I, I, no, surely there's got to be someone else that is better suited for this job. I, what about Luke? Luke, he's smarter than me. He, you remember you asked him to write those books? I, really, why not, why not Luke? Or, or Titus. Maybe you should choose Titus. You know, Titus is a much harder worker. He's, he's done much harder jobs. You remember you sent him to Crete. That was much harder than Ephesus. Maybe Titus is the guy. Or, hey, I know. How about Apollos? Apollos is eloquent. People like him. They listen to him. People like Apollos way better than they like me. Maybe, maybe you should pick someone else. I, don't you know what the commentators are going to say about me? I'm sickly. I'm shy. I'm cowardly. I'm not prepared for this. I'm too young. I'm inferior. Yeah, that second one is the one that I'm saying too. Why did Timothy need to hear this from Paul right now? Remember that history of succession stories, and now let's go back and read what Paul says to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Why does Paul need to, excuse me, why does Timothy need to hear this from Paul right now? Timothy doesn't need to hear from Paul, hey, you got this. Timothy doesn't need to hear from Paul, no, no, really, you're good enough, you're qualified, you're the guy. Timothy needs to hear your God is amazing. And Timothy, it hasn't been about me. It's been about God who is with me. And it's not gonna be about you, Timothy. It's gonna be about God who is with you. And Timothy, with God, you have everything you need. Regrettably, when it comes to this passage, we, we typically spend our time bickering about the details. This, this gift, was it a miraculous gift? Is it speaking in tongues? Is it prophecy? Is it gifts of healing, miracles, wonders, or, or some combination? Or is it the commission? Is it the gift of being able to preach and be the protege of Paul? Well, we have our opinions on those, but really from the text, it's not certain. None of our opinions on that are certain. And then the spirit there. Is the spirit, is it supposed to be spirit? Or is it spirit? That is, is it the lowercase spirit? Is it the, well, just the, the spirit, the demeanor, the attitude, the kind of personality that Timothy has? Or is it to be the uppercase spirit, the capitalized spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God who is the spirit of power and love and sound mind? We've all got our opinions on that. But the reality is from the text, our opinions won't be certain. And then we wonder if, if all of this is about what Paul passed on to Timothy by the laying on of his hands, how can any of this apply to any of us anyway? I have no doubt that there is a place for all of those discussions. There's a place to chase those rabbits. And there's a place for us to learn the lessons that come from discussing that back and forth. But for today, for today, let's not miss the forest because we're busy turning over the leaves of every tree. What is it that Paul is saying to Timothy right now? Timothy, it's not about you. I haven't chosen you because you're amazing. I've chosen you because your God, the God in whom you believe, is amazing. Timothy, you're, you're Joshua. You're Joshua who, who had the spirit of wisdom because Moses laid his hands on him. And Joshua was not alone. God was with him. You're not alone, Timothy. God is with you. Go take the land. And Timothy, you're, you're Elisha. It's not about you. It's about God who is with you. And you've got the spirit of power and love and sound mind with you. You're not alone. God is with you. Go take on the evil kings. And Timothy, you're not Saul. You're not Saul. You don't have a harmful spirit. You don't have a spirit of fear. You're David. A spirit of power and love and sound mind. You're not alone. 
God is with you. Go slay Goliath. Timothy, it's not about you. It's about your God. It's about the God you believe in. And when you have God, you have all you need. You're prepared for this mission. Fathers, I don't know what advice you've been giving your sons and daughters. And sons and daughters, I, I don't know what advice your fathers or your mothers have been giving you. Perhaps you're like Timothy and you're a fatherless child. But Paul is speaking and he's not Timothy's father. But he's saying to Timothy the exact same thing he would say to us, even though he's not our father. And he's letting us know it's not about us. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about Timothy. It's not about us. It's about God who is with us. And I get it. Your, your gifts, my gifts are different than Timothy's. Your mission, your commission is different than Timothy's. But your God is the same as Timothy's. My God is the same as Timothy's. And when we have God, we have all we need. And we're prepared. And so we have no need to fear and no need to be ashamed. Because with God and faith in him, we can be courageous. And we will win the victory. Fathers, I have to confess to you that as a father like you, I don't know that I've always done a great job passing this message on to my children. And I don't say that because of anything they do or don't do. I say that because of what I know I have done and not done. And I'm afraid that far too often, I have bounced back and forth between two incorrect messages, sometimes saying to my children, you're not good enough. And I've never said those words to them, but I'm I'm afraid that all too often that's the message I've conveyed. And then bounce from that to the other extreme of, oh, no, no, it's you, you're good enough, you've got this, it's all you, you can handle this on your own. And yet when the childless father Paul talked to the fatherless child Timothy, he didn't say either one of those things. He didn't say you're not good enough, but he didn't say you are good enough. What he said was, is your God is good enough. And he gave him the two ingredients your God, and faith in him. That's the courage. That's the victory. And Paul says to Timothy the words that we need to remember in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Our king went to the cross and what a fearful moment that was. It was a moment that looked like he was lost. He was suffering the shame of a criminal. And we can understand why people might be ashamed of him. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose victorious. And now he walks with us through whatever we face. Paul had fought the good fight. He had kept the faith. A crown of righteousness was laid up for him. And it didn't end in this life with a parade, with a laurel wreath, with honor and accolades. It ended in a Roman prison executed by the sword. But Paul's king walked with him. And Paul will rise victorious. And he passed on the mantle to Timothy. And if historical tradition is true, for 30 years, Timothy carried on the mission. And he ended up being a bishop in the church of Ephesus, and he defended the faith. And he taught, and he fulfilled the work. But his life didn't end in a parade and accolades. It ended as pagans clubbed him to death, beating him with sticks and rocks and clubs. But his king walked with him. And he will rise victorious. I don't know what you're facing. I know that tribulation is the path to the kingdom. And sometimes it looks like we're losing. And I get it. 
feelings of inferiority, of shame and fear, of lack of preparation, of guilt, they plague us. But it's not about us. It's about our God. It's about our King. And when we have God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we have everything we need. We have God, and we have faith in Him. And that is the courage. And that is the victory. God in heaven, we struggle. We struggle because we feel inferior to others. We feel that we can't accomplish this. We feel we can't possibly get it done. And yet, God, it is not about us. It's about you. And so we put our faith in you. We put our hand in yours. And Lord God, we walk hand in hand with your son, Jesus, with your Holy Spirit, with the power and love and sound mind that are yours. And we look forward to the victory. And today and tomorrow, we will put one foot in front of the other and we will walk by faith, giving our allegiance to you. And we will rise victorious. We praise you, our God. Thank you for loving us first. It's through your Son, our Savior and King, we pray. Amen.
Hello Church and welcome friends. I'm glad that we've had this time to be together, to pray, to sing praises, to study God's Word, especially to think about fathers. And of course, on the Lord's Day, we do spend time thinking about our Heavenly Father, God Almighty, and the mission that He had for His Son, His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why, in John chapter 3 and verse 16, the Scripture says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God, our Heavenly Father, loved us so much He could not allow us to languish in sin and to be destined for an eternity separated from Him in hell. He devised a plan to redeem us, to bring forgiveness of our sins and reconciliation with Him that we could be at home with Him forever in heaven. But oh, at what price? The sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, the life He gave for our sins. We remember the life He gave for our sins as we share in the communion. When we eat the bread, we remember His body that was given. When we drink the cup, we remember His blood that was shed. The fruit of the vine, which reminds us of a new covenant where we have forgiveness of sins. But we do this on Sunday. We do this every Sunday. It is the Lord's Day. Why? Well, in part because Sunday is the day of resurrection. The Lord rose and conquered death early in the morning on the first day of the week. The tomb was found empty. And notice the significance of that resurrection declared in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, in verse number 1, as this letter begins, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God which he, that's God, promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ was a son of David. There was earthly lineage but he is the Son of God, and this declared in the glory and the power of the resurrection. And so as we reflect at this time about his death, on the day that we remember his resurrection, let us be assured that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And may that good confession guide our steps this week. Won't you bow? Our great God and Father, we are so thankful that we have this day, that as a nation we are mindful of fathers and of the home that you have established, with a husband and a wife, a father and mother that you bless with children. We pray in a special way that you might be with fathers today, that they might be mindful of their sons and daughters, the example they set and the lessons that they teach. We know that we always have a good and right heavenly father, that we might come to you through the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer for the forgiveness of our sins by the gospel. We pray, God, that you might bless us today and this week to lead lives and lead families that are about your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.